I want to thank everybody for coming out on such a hot day. So um, those of you who haven't heard our speaker, you're in for a real treat. I had the pleasure of reading his work before I met him. I've been impressed with Dr. Kahati for many years, and he came to our college. I think I'd been on, on duty about six weeks, and he came, and I had the pleasure of meeting him and listening to him. And it's, I think, especially important for those of us who are interested in indigenous knowledge systems, philosophically, scientifically, spiritually, sociologically, um, creatively, artistically, uh, Dr. Kahedi's work embodies all of those ideas, and that's something that we work towards understanding, particularly at tribal college universities. And so with that, let's welcome our guest today, Dr. Kahedi. Thank you. First, boy, it's, it's really, really cold here. I don't know how you can stand it. It's so cold. <laughs> <laughs> the symposium that I was uh, a co-keynote um, with uh, and, and the other keynote was uh, Jeremy uh, Rifkin and Melissa Nelson. And um, what was being talked about essentially were some, um, really in terms of Jeremy Rifkin, some up-to-date uh, or most recent research with regard to uh, climate change. And um, it's, it's kind of snowballing effect, you know, with regard to our um, respective environments. Um, so um, it, it's, it was a very sobering talk, a very, um, uh, how should I say, uh, a much food for thought, you know, in terms of indigenous uh, thinking. Um, and of course, Jeremy Rifkin works at a national, international level, you know, uh, really talking to heads of state about uh, these kinds of issues and creating strategies for dealing with those issues. And one of the things that uh, was pretty noticeable in his talk was that there was really no mention of the indigenous voice or the indigenous platform, uh, again, that has been going on really among indigenous people, we've been working on, you know, <laughs> these issues of how the climate, the climate is changing and trying to, in a sense, mitigate, you know, some of those changes as it affects us uh, for, you know, several decades now. And uh, it still was not and is not at the, um, how should I say, in, in any shape of the form, as they say, uh, on the radar screen, you know, of, of uh, the larger society. So it was, um, it was very telling that uh, the indigenous voice, you know, while, while it, it, it is present, uh, it needs to be amplified, you know, with regard to the kinds of issues that we uh, are facing today. And indigenous forms of, of, of thinking about the environment and relating to the environment need to be amplified, uh, if nothing more than just as simply as examples of possibilities for uh, you know, how you begin to relate in a new way, in a different way, in a more sustainable way to uh, our natural environment. So uh, the indigenous mind is rising and uh, whether it is on kind of, uh, you would say the international or national radar screen, I think is um, not a testament to, to our not wanting it to be there, but I think a testament to, to the fact that uh, uh, you know, we've been excluded largely from that discussion, but have to really begin to, 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 to make our voice known and make our voice heard in a much broader kind of way. And I think so this national uh, conversations with the earth and, uh, and among other things that are going on worldwide are beginning to, in a sense, uh, amplify that indigenous voice and make it real. So. The slide presentation I have to, for you today basically is a part of that amplification, if you will, of the uh, indigenous voice. Uh, uh, 30 plus years ago, I was asked uh, to come to the Institute of American Indian Arts and create a curriculum that integrated science with art with the cultural perspectives of the students that were attending the Institute at that time. 
and I was given uh, really the resources and, and I guess you might say the creative freedom as a teacher to actually create such a curriculum. And so out of that process uh, of creation and, and, and curriculum uh, emerged several kinds of courses. And so native uh, astronomy is uh, the seventh course of seven courses that I created uh, as a part of the uh, curriculum uh, Igniting the Sparkle, which um, was meant to, again, integrate science with art, with cultural perspectives of students. But uh, again, I'm talking about 30, 25 to 30 years ago when uh, I actually was introducing these ideas and these uh, perspectives in curriculum and also in terms of content. Um, uh, so it's interesting that it's, it's now, just now, actually beginning to, to become, I, I guess you might say, relevant in some of the discourses that are going on in education today. So it takes a long time, you see, for that indigenous voice uh, to get out there. So I'm hoping that you'll enjoy this presentation uh, because it talks about one of the areas of native science. I wrote a book, uh, Native Science, uh, Laws of, of uh, Interdependence, and it uh, is one of the chapters in that book. So uh, uh, Native Science is one of the books that is available. You can find it through uh, Amazon. And uh, I really recommend that uh, if you haven't read that book, you should, because it's, uh, it's it, as I said, this is only one of the chapters, one of uh, eight chapters that deal with uh, different aspects of native science. But I like it because it exemplifies the uh, thoughts and ideas and perspectives of indigenous people with regard to this kind of resonance, if you will, that. Native people have always attempted to, to establish with uh, things that matter to them, things that gave them life. And uh, many tribes uh, um, think of themselves as people of the stars. Uh, Western science, in a sense, confirms the, the fact that it probably took some stardust coming to the earth uh, to, in a sense, fertilize, you know, the, the first uh, inklings of life on Earth. And so that the metaphor of we are star people, uh, or Native people saying we are star people, is not too far from that truth, because in, indeed that was part of that process, we think, of, of the first life on Earth. Um, how many of you have heard of 2012? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, by now everyone, you know, who has any sort of <laughs> communication probably has heard of 2012. And of course that's right around the corner. And, and so I thought that this presentation would be a good 2012 kind of sequel. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a few minutes because it, it does have relevance to this, this presentation. Although I haven't put all my 2012 stuff onto this, I'm still... Uh, re-researching it. Native astronomy through perspective, uh, perspectives through native eyes. Um, one of the things that we know is that uh, native people have always been interested in the uh, night sky. And some of the earliest, earliest evidence on this continent with regard to that interest uh, is actually uh, in uh, Baja, Mexico, where you find uh, this outcropping of rocks that is very particularly situated in reference to the, the horizons. You can see both horizons, where the sun rises, where the sun sets from this outcropping of rock. And on, on that rock, you have uh, basically a tallying system that, that has been inscribed, you know, scratched into the rock. And uh, we think this uh, tallying system is about uh, anywhere from 12 to 15,000 years old is, uh, are some of the dates that are estimated, which would mean that it was a Italian system that was used uh, by Paleo-Indian peoples, uh, probably as they ranged you know, through that part of the world uh, uh, in the sense of, of looking for uh, game animals. Uh, it's actually very accurate. Uh, there are points where you can stand, where you can see the summer solstice rising, the summer solstice setting, uh, when you can see, uh, you know, uh, demarcations that 
that from positions and standing in, in certain places where you can actually see uh, the equinoxes, the equinox suns as well. Uh, we know that it's a tallying system because the, the markings uh, mark uh, phases between equinoxes, mark days between equinoxes. And there are a variety of other kinds of symbols associated with that rock outcropping that uh, archaeologists are not sure exactly what they mean, but they're definitely symbols that are related to the stars. So we have, you know, evidence that indigenous people were, uh, were actually not only, in a sense, watching the night sky, you know, 15,000 years ago, but they were actually, in a sense, making very accurate observations of the night sky in a variety, and using a variety of different minds and mechanisms to count, you know, those days between those important points in time. You know, not too far from here, you have the whole medicine wheel complex. And so uh, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel is one example of many kinds of, of uh, structures that uh, are more like eight to 10,000 years old in this case. So they're, they're a later tradition, but they still really exemplify Paleo-Indian peoples uh, in this continent making very, very accurate observations of uh, the night sky, uh, anticipating when the summer solstice and when the winter, winter solstice would come, uh, and, and having a good sense of uh, that circular nature of time uh, in which they live. So, so this particular structure, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel, again marks uh, summer solstice sunset, you know, by positioning yourself and various positions around the circle, you can actually uh, see where the summer solstice uh, sun is setting, where the summer solstice sun is rising. Uh, it has um, other points that if you stand in them, you can see Aldebaran and also Rigel rising. And these are what we call, and also Sirius rising as well. And these are what we call uh, anticipatory uh, stars. So there's, they're in certain positions in the night sky uh, just before uh, summer solstice uh, sunrise or winter solstice sunrise. And so we know that uh, in order to do this kind of observation that you had to actually anticipate and you had to actually recognize that certain stars in a sense lead uh, and are in certain positions in the sky uh, a few days uh, before the uh, summer solstice, uh, winter solstice. So again, in order to do that requires observation, requires uh, uh, calculation, requires uh, uh, adjustment. You know, even just to create the structure of, of the medicine wheel requires an uh, enormous amount of observation and adjustment, observation and adjustment in order to get those positions right. And so we know that, that Native people were doing this, you know, in, in very sophisticated ways for that time. Uh, and, and, you know, the medicine wheel is, is just one of literally hundreds of medicine wheels, maybe even thousands of medicine wheels that existed in that area at one time. Just to give you an example, um, for instance, of the uh, horizon astronomy, which was so apparent in those days was that, uh, that they were able to create structures that, in a sense, um, aligned, aligned structures that if, if you were, again, position yourself in certain places around that circle, you could see the sun uh, and probably also the moon in uh, particular kinds of positions and certainly stars in the night sky above you. And uh, this just gives you a, a sense of where the medicine wheel sites you can see most of them are in Alberta. Uh, the discovered sites, Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan, uh, and then they come on into uh, uh, Montana, uh, some in North Dakota, and they go as far as um, uh, uh, northern uh, Colorado. Um, so we know that there was a whole tradition of sun watching, stargazing, you know, that was a part of, of the peoples who lived in that area uh, eight to 10,000 years ago. Now, we know that Native people moved, uh, you know, the, because the Rocky Mountains forms a kind of natural uh, highway, if you will. So they moved up and down, you know, in a variety of different kinds of, of movements. 
uh, going into Canada, then coming uh, further south and even further south into New Mexico, and then on going on into, into Mexico. Part of it was probably that they were following uh, herds of uh, bison and herds of, uh, of various, you know, what we call megafauna, you know, uh, and uh, because they were hunters. But we also know that hunters didn't necessarily need such an accurate uh, calendar, you know. Um, but uh, we, we know that they were very interested in it. And so uh, there's still some question as to why you would, as hunting cultures, build such elaborate sites. Those uh, cultures then evolved into uh, some uh, even uh, later cultures, uh, one of which were the mound builders. So here's a, a painting of um, what a mound builder uh, priest, uh, moon priest may have looked like uh, as he was, uh, or sun priest rather, uh, as he was making an offering to uh, the sun, which was often uh, one of the reasons why those mounds were being built. Uh, they were ceremonial mounds. Uh, they were positioned in a variety of different kinds of ways uh, to uh, give greater advantage uh, in watching the sunrise and sunset, uh, because these are forested areas generally that uh, that were um, where the mound builders actually lived. Uh, so cultures like Cahokia and Natchez uh, were, uh, you know, mound building cultures that we know were were trading with uh, the Maya and the Yucatan, were trading with the Toltec, uh, were trading up along the Galveston and, and uh, the southeastern uh, Gulf of Mexico and on into the Mississippi. And so uh, we know that by this time, uh, what was happening was there was a lot of exchange of ideas. There was a lot of trading. You know, there were lots of, of uh, trade routes that were being used uh, not only water routes, you know, in terms of the Mississippi, Gulf of Mexico, but also land routes, uh, some of which are the, uh, the interstate uh, national highways that we have today uh, that probably traced some of those routes, you know, in terms of, of getting from point A to point B. Um, we know that uh, the mound builder cultures were extremely sophisticated cultures. They, they had the ability to organize large communities, uh, anywhere from 40 and some estimate as high as 60,000 in Cahokia alone uh, as one of, the, uh, one of the cities. But there were many others you know, along that Mississippi, that mound builder uh, territory. Um, we also have a structure that is called uh, Woodhenge. Uh, and, and a uh, structure that, in which uh, poles were used very much like Stonehenge is used in order to anticipate, again, summer uh, sunrise and um, summer solstice sunrise and winter solstice sunrise. We believe then the lineage went to, uh, from the mound builders, went into uh, various other tribes like the Skidi Pawnee. But many other tribes that, that, in a sense, inherited some of the lore and tradition and really uh, uh, scientific knowledge, if you will, of, of the mound builders. And so the star people, uh, or the Skidipani, uh, called themselves specifically the star people. And, and um, we think that they, um, they uh, uh, attempted to what we call mimic uh, so in the sky, so on earth, you know, so that using that metaphor, they tried to mimic the, um, the key constellations that different clans had adopted. They tried to mimic the formation of those constellations in the positioning of their mounds or their, their uh, earth lodges on earth so that if you were to, let's say, fly over a Skidi Pani village of, uh, let's say, 1840, 1850, uh, you would see clusters of uh, earth mounds, uh, earth mound buildings that would look uh, similar to constellations. If you looked in the night sky, you would be able to find those same formations. Uh, and these were, uh, in a sense, what we call um, a resonant, star resonant communities, okay? They, they were attempting to resonate how, uh, so, so in the sky, so on earth, okay? That kind of thing. 
so the Skidipani uh, star robe, as you can see, the star priest, he's holding a star robe. There were particular uh, knowledge holders in Skidipani tradition that uh, held that knowledge. Uh, uh, we know that it, it, it permeated every aspect of Skidipani life. Uh, they used, uh, you know, their knowledge of positions of stars and position and, and summer solstice sunrise, summer solstice sunset, the different uh, positions of the moon during its 18 year cycle uh, to time both their ceremonies and also to time hunts but because uh, during a part of the year they were basically farmers. Uh, during the other part of the year they were hunters. And so they were using uh, their knowledge, you know, in practical ways, uh, you know, to time their, their plantings, to time their harvest, to time their hunts. Uh, probably with a lot of knowledge of uh, not only the plants that they were growing, which were corn, beans, and squash, and other kinds of uh, wild uh, plants, but also uh, the movement, especially of buffalo, deer, elk, uh, antelope. Uh, all of those kinds of animals that they depended on for hunting. So there was a practical use for some of this, but, uh, but we know that, that there were also ceremonial connotations and there were also ecological, uh, embedded ecological uh, systems of knowledge in, in the lore that the Skidipani carried with them with regard to their star. So if you were to take a look at, um, and there is one at the Field Museum that's been reproduced of the Skidipani uh, Earth Lodge, uh, you would see that um, that it's, it, it very much represents uh, the um, a representation of the Earth, almost like a uh, Navajo hogan in some ways. In a sense, uh, the structure represents uh, a kind of model as the people perceive of of how the Earth uh, and how the cosmos are related to each other. And so they had certain uh, kinds of ways in which they would build these earth, uh, earth lodges. Um, one of the favorite pastimes of the uh, Pani, uh, as, as uh, is recorded, is that they would sit uh, on hot evenings, like, like the one that's to come this evening, and simply tell star stories as they watch the stars and watch the positions of stars move around in the sky. So that's what the people are doing. You can see they're sitting on their, on their mounds. Uh, they, use the, they use the structure itself, the, the earth lodge structure, uh, to time and to remember what time of season they were in. And they actually moved the, the household activities, you know, uh, to different uh, parts of the earth lodge during different times of the year. Uh, to commemorate the time of year that it was. Okay, so in springtime they were in one place, in winter yet, yet another, in, in uh, summer yet another, and in spring yet another. Uh, we also uh, uh, think that they, they also had uh, niches that were cut in particular places within the, the lodge itself that allowed uh, light and allowed them to look out and, and that they were positioned to to capture certain stars, uh, you know, when those stars were in a particular position, so that they could see it in the in the um, in the dome of, of the Earth Lodge. Um, so most of them uh, faced the west. There were four basic uh, pillars that held up the uh, structure. Each pillar represented one of the semi-cardinal directions recognized by the Skidipani. Uh, you can see then the, the other supporting poles of the uh, structure uh, went around in a, in a circular fashion and uh, the entrance was the, to the east and when the sun would rise, uh, especially around summer solstice time, it would uh, send light into the uh, earth lodge and strike the uh, buffalo uh, altar that was uh, on the other side of the uh, lodge. So you can see that um, uh, this idea of empathy and also resonance with uh, the movement of the, of the night sky, the movement of the heavens was a very important thing to be doing, you know, among the Skidipani. It was something that uh, allowed you to, to relate to, you know, what was going on in the night sky in a very direct, almost physical and visceral way. So, 
uh, most uh, tribes uh, actually recognized the cardinal directions. The Skidi Pawnee were uh, interested in the semi-cardinal directions. Uh, they're they're, they're u somewhat unique in that. And so for a long time, historians were saying, well, why are they interested in the semi-cardinal directions? You know, most tribes are north, south, east, and west. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, first, um, this idea of sacred orientation then comes into play uh, because the attempt is to, is to emulate so uh, in the sky, so on earth. And so uh, you see that uh, the semi-cardinal directions are recognized, the northwest, the northeast, the southeast, and the southwest. Within each of those, those directions, a color, uh, red, white, yellow, black, are recognized. A uh, natural phenomena like clouds, winds, lightning, and thunder are recognized. Uh, an animal such as the wolf, the wildcat, mountain lion, and bear are recognized. And finally, a tree, uh, willow, box elder, uh, cottonwood, and elm. So these are uh, what we call emblematic uh, symbols that represent a quality of that direction that was important to recognize among the Skidi Pawnee. All tribes do this. All tribes recognize the, the sacred orientation of the directions um, for, and associate plants and animals and colors and even th ways of thinking, ways of doing uh, associated with each of these. But the, the key thing, is, the, the key difference here is that this, these are semi-cardinal directions. And so the question remains, why were they using semi-cardinal directions? Um, I don't have the slide, but we, we have one surviving buffalo hide that is on display at the uh, Field Museum in, in Chicago that is, also uh, that is also formed in this way. And it's a star map. It's a star chart. And so uh, basically they, they, because they were so interested in the night sky, this, this can be projected into the, into the sky and in each of those quadrants basically you have uh, particular stars and, and constellations that, uh, that were associated and that were important to the Skidi Pani. So this was basically uh, extending you know, a terrestrial orientation to a celestial orientation in the night. And so that's the reason for the for the uh, semi-cardinal directions, you know, the use of that. And actually it quite, works quite well. If you project this into the night sky and you, and, and you consider that the center is Polaris, the North Star, you see that the constellations, very much like the zodiac, do move around that, do move in, in, into the houses of the, the semi-cardinal directions. So um, you had other mechanisms like the uh, winter count, uh, which uh, was also uh, based on what was happening um, during different times of the season. Uh, usually the, the winter count uh, painter was also a, uh, uh, a observer of the night sky and so uh, as, well, uh, as well as a historian. And so the use and depiction of uh, you know, events in the sky, especially among the Skidi Pawnee and other Plains tribes, not just the Pawnee, uh, were found uh, on uh, buffalo hides many times. And so, you know, buffalo hides last a certain period of time and then they uh, disintegrate. So we don't have too many examples of buffalo hides uh, with star information on it, but there are a few that uh, recorded during certain times of the year and certain positions of the, s the sun and moon and constellations that there were certain kinds of celestial events happening. So again, we know that indigenous people were intimately, intimately involved with looking at the night sky. Um, symbols of authority, we know that also that, um, that there was a connection between uh, authority on earth and authority in the sky. So there were certain uh, planets or certain stars that were considered chiefs of stars, you know, and so there was a kind of translation, and so, so there was this tradition which we call star kings, star kings. 
uh, canes of authority, okay, canes of authority. And, and this tradition was actually kind of widespread in North America because you usually had some, some person, an elder, who, whose job it was to keep track of, you know, where is the sun today? You know, how, how close is it coming to summer solstice or winter solstice? And the most natural way is to get up, you know, go and look at where the sun is and then to make a mark, okay, to make a mark uh, on something like a stick. You say, okay, this number of days between this, this position of the sun, this number of days between this position of the sun. You could also do this for the moon as well. Uh, although it would take you 18 and a half years to have a complete record of that. But uh, it was done. It was done. So, um, uh, so you have two, two uh, portraits. One is uh, Tahana Odom uh, Elder, who's holding a star cane. And then you have a uh, Creek chief who's holding a star cane. Uh, and actually, they're very similar. You know, very different parts of the country, but yet the similar idea of holding a star cane, a marked star cane, uh, that also represented an emblem of authority. Um, when the Spanish came to New Mexico, because we also had uh, this tradition, uh, the um, Spanish, uh, as they were negotiating with the Pueblo tribes, offered the Pueblo tribes these canes of authority. Uh, they were actually carved canes that they gave to each of the uh, communities in the Pueblos. Um, and those, those canes had meaning to us because of the fact that we had used them and they were indeed uh, emblems of authority that, uh, that we recognized. And so we accepted those canes of authority and uh, establishing, in a sense, at that time, the Spanish uh, system of governance, uh, but yet keeping our own form of governance at the same time. But it's interesting the way that the canes of authority, in and of themselves, they have a story uh, among different tribes. The Maori, you know, the Hawaiians, you know, they also carry these talking canes. And these are elaborately carved uh, canes that uh, represent your authority, your clan, your group, uh, Northwest Native peoples also have canes. So, so this idea of canes of authority is very widespread. Um, naming the constellations, you know, each tribe had its very particular names for constellations. And so that's a whole uh, story, uh, storied system. And um, it's one that um, uh, I think needs retelling and re- uh, visiting and revival. Uh, so many uh, tribes are now uh, exploring and researching uh, the names they had for their night sky constellation. Because, you know, when you look at the night sky, you know, there's a bunch of dots, okay? <laughs> there's, there's bright dots and little dots and all kinds, and there's different kinds of ways to connect the dots, so to speak, and make different forms. Uh, that's kind of a neat exercise. You just project up and see how many different kinds of designs you can make out of connecting the dots, you know. Well, basically, that's the same thing. We project our psyche, our sense of uh, stories, the stories that are important to us, into, into that uh, night sky. And so uh, the connection between story and uh, the sky, you know, becomes apparent in the ways in which various constellations, that's why I call it storylines, are created, you know, as a result of looking at the night sky. So let's switch now to South America and take a look at uh, the Nazca geoglyphs. Of course, uh, some of you may have seen a National Geographic and a few other uh, documentaries on, on the Nazca lines. Uh, the Nazca lines were really discovered uh, when, uh, I think it was a TWA fl flying over the Andes uh, when they saw the plains of Nazca and they realized that you know, the plains of Nazca were actually decorated with these gigantic geoglyphs of different kinds of animals, mythological animals, pottery designs, and they're, and, and they're actually layered. So we know that they were being created and recreated and created again generation after generation after generation. Uh, 
so for a long time, no one knew what those geoglyphs were about, and, and, and they remained a kind of mystery. Um, until a woman whose name is Maria Reich, uh, who actually was a German mathematician, uh, began to explore them uh, in terms of their relationship to the ancient Nazca cultures and the contemporary cultures of that region. And so what she began to find was that um, these designs were similar to some of the designs that were appearing in Nazca pottery and that there was connection between those, those designs and those forms uh, to the stories and the mythologies that the Nazca uh, and some of the subsequent peoples had with regard to the sky. Uh, and uh, then she began to, to, to sort of theorize that um, these, these um, designs could actually be a kind of zodiac, zodiac symbols. Uh, because they had certain lines that went through them that went into the horizon and then into the night sky and connected with different constellations or different stars. And um, so she began to put forward the idea that this was a giant calendar, a giant calendric zodiac system that were being used by the Nazca uh, at one time. They were connected to again, position of, of the, the, uh, the stars and constellation during certain important times uh, and also uh, uh, to, to mark uh, solstice times, equinox times. Um, so uh, the other mystery was how could they create such, you know, geometrically, you know, beautiful and aesthetic designs without a measurement, measurement system? So then here's her interest as a mathematician because there had to be some sort of measuring uh, system that was used. So she proposed a number of theories and ideas. Uh, this measurement, you know, from the tip of the uh, index finger to the elbow was uh, a, a, uh, a, a, what we call an indigenous yard, okay? It's not quite a yard, but it's, it's, it's one of the measurements that was being used. Uh, the index finger itself is another measurement. The hand, the length of the hand from the index to the wrist is another uh, measurement. Uh, the length of the thumb is another measurement. And so uh, these are the measurements that are still used today among uh, many of the peoples who live in that region. So she began to again use, you know, what is there already to, to sort of extrapolate from that what could have been in the, in the past. And so they would actually do measurements, you know, of people of these designs based on those traditional measurements. And they found that they basically worked. That's exactly what they were using. But they were finding ways to, in a sense, uh, use proportion, you know. So, so this meant a certain distance uh, in, in, in terms of how you would draw out a line on the, on the Nazca plane. So uh, Maria Reich and cosmic calendars. Um, there was a gentleman whose name, and probably you may have heard of him, his name is uh, Van Doniken, uh, wrote Chariot of the Gods a few years ago, become very popularized, where he said this was a, a place where alien spaceships landed, and these were their kind of uh, marking symbols, and that you know, these, these long lines, pathway lines, were actually uh, lines where, uh, um, well, you know, just like airports today, they were basically landing fields. And he's still out there saying that. He's still out there. I mean, this has been like 35 or 40 years, you know, but he's still out there uh, saying that. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to say that um, it isn't possible that we have been visited by, by you know, extraterrestrials. Uh, because, you know, for Native people, everything is possible. But uh, on the other hand, I'm going to say that uh, this doesn't give too much credit to the ingenuity of Native people and their ability, uh, even at that time. As, and there's, the evidence is far beyond anything that Van Donikin is proposing. The evidence is there that indigenous people on this continent were every bit as capable. They had a sophistication about their knowledge and understanding uh, that they, they could do these kinds of things. Uh, even without our modern uh, instrumentation and technology. 
So Maria Reich uh, sort of broke open that, that uh, myth, you know, that these were extraterrestrial landing fields and uh, proposed a theory that it still holds a lot of, a lot of weight today. Um, I'll get to cosmic calendars when I talk about 2012 kinds of things. Um, let's go to Fajardo Butte in my area in New Mexico. Um, Fajardo Butte is a very beautiful, uh, large uh, valley uh, in uh, northwest New Mexico. Um, it's uh, the site of uh, one of the largest uh, Anasazi uh, uh, ruin complexes. Um, and for a long time, you know, Fajardo Butte remained undiscovered. But in 1977, uh, Anna Sofia, who is a, um, was actually an artist and photographer, happened to be up uh, and climbing up uh, on Fajardo Butte around uh, about maybe about 10 days before summer solstice. And, uh, you know, as she was climbing around taking pictures of petroglyphs because that was, that's what she was doing. She was doing uh, petroglyph documentation. She uh, stopped to rest and she um, noticed that behind these, these slabs of stone that there was a, a light uh, shadow kind of dance going on. And so as when she explored it closer, she found that there was this uh, spiral that was carved into the sandstone and that as the sun was moving across uh, at noontime, the, the daggers of light were forming in, in a variety of different ways around that spiral. So she came up the next day and she photographed it. She came up the next day and she photographed it. She then went to tell others, come up and see this because something is happening here. A few, just a very few, including the park rangers, wouldn't go up with her, but a few friends went up with her. They also saw it. They documented. They, they took pictures of it. And before you know it, uh, what she was documenting, she realized as, as the closer that summer solstice uh, noontime came, that this was actually marking summer solstice. And, and from that, you know, observation, and here are those three slabs of stone, very inconspicuous, but they're placed in such a way that they form uh, these daggers of light, you know, just based on where the sun is going over them uh, during uh, noontime. And so that's the way it looks, finding the center, you know, as, as and she was there actually to photograph as the sun is moving over at noontime. A dagger of light forms in the very center of, those, of that spiral, marking the summer solstice uh, within just a few minutes of its actual you know, position, its actual, uh, what we call actual uh, scientific positioning of, of summer solstice you know, at that time. And so we know that, um, and these daggers of light you know, last for only maybe uh, uh, five to uh, five to seven minutes. You know, it's a very short period of time where you can actually see the dagger form, and then it and then it hits the center. Um, she began to say, "Hey, something is going on here." She's a scientist, she's an artist, and she's a woman. But she's telling the scientists, "Come up here and look at this. Something is going on, <laughs> and this is not something that happens in an ordinary way." Uh, they didn't believe her. Uh, she went forward with her, her findings, and these are visual pictures, you know, she's a very good photographer. She's showing all of these. She was accused of uh, rigging those photos, you know, she was, uh, so then she gets, uh, she starts to become a scientist. She starts to do her homework about solstice and about uh, archaeoastronomy, about movement of the sun and moon during certain times. She then begins to, to document, you know, everything. So long story short, she takes this to Oxford, England, and um, presents it to the World Archaeoastronomy, presents her evidence. And they come back and astounded and say, this is, uh, this is the only place in the world where this kind of structure marks uh, summer solstice at noontime. So it, it was a watershed event in the whole uh, archaeoastronomy um, discipline. 
they have not ever accepted that any of any indigenous people, very much like Vandonikin, <laughs> that indigenous people could actually do this kind of precision marking of time. Uh, what that opened up was that they began to re-look at a lot of these kinds of sites around the world and they began to find out that many indigenous people were doing this kind of light shadow play, you know, to mark uh, the summer solstice. And that, um, that the sun dagger was only one, although an elaborate example, but there was only one in the southwest. Uh, there were many other ways in the southwest all the way into Mexico that this was being done. So the dance of light and shadow to light the world. Um, why is that so important in native life? Uh, that resonance, that idea of resonance becomes real important so that um, the sun is, is, you know, the major purveyor of life on earth. It is the major, in a sense, entity in the, in the sky. Uh, it gives us our sense of time. It gives us our, our, our warmth. Uh, all of the kinds of, of understandings that people have about the sun, you know, become, in a sense, uh, a reason for marking that very, very important time when the sun is in a particular kind of position uh, in the night sky or in the, in the day. Uh, and so this one is one of the only ones that still marks uh, a fairly accurate uh, timing at noon. Uh, although when the scientists were uh, trying to establish whether, whether um, uh, Sophia, Anna Sophia was correct, they, um, they started you know, walking on top of those structures. And so the, the structures actually shifted so it does not mark the uh, summer solstice as accurately as it did when uh, Anna Sophia, at, you know, discovered it. So, you know, science, scientists. <laughs> <laughs> solstice, uh, I'm, a, I'm a biologist myself, so I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a way of thinking about what you do and respect for what you do also, you know, an ethic that you have. Solstice and equinox. They found also that, that this was such an elaborate system that uh, be, they, they used the same structure to mark the equinoxes. Uh, during the equinoxes, the, um, the uh, um, dagger is on one side of the uh, uh, center of the spiral. Uh, during midsummer, it's in the center. During midwinter, there are two spirals, uh, uh, two daggers rather, that come and actually bracket the, uh, the, the spiral in the center. And then there's this little curious little, uh, curious little other petroglyph on the side of that, and people didn't say, well, that, is that decoration, or what is that? Well, not, everything has a purpose. Uh, they began to find that that mechanism is used to mark the 18 and a half year cycle of the moon. So this actually uh, marks moonlight as well. It marks the position of the moon during its 18 and a half year cycle. So you have to be out in moonlight, a full moon moving over in the moon in a certain position to see uh, this little, this little uh, entity do its work, uh, which is the, uh, the moon circle. So it's both sun and moon. And it's the only site in the world that does this, that we know of. It's the only site in the world that does mark the, both the sun and the moon simultaneously. So time and space, you know, become conceptions and ideas, you know, because Native people were also dealing with issues of what is the nature of time and space and uh, what is that reality. Um, and for a long time, people didn't understand how native perceived, how native people perceived time and space um, until uh, this form of uh, Western science came into being called quantum physics. And at that time, then they began to think and understand that um, time is relative. Time is a matter of perception. Time it can be long or short, depending on how you, the observer, you, the experiencer of time and space perceive it. 
that our mind comes into play in a very discreet and very uh, particular kind of way to give us our perception of time. So, so all of us have had the phenomena of time passes too fast, uh, especially when you're having fun doing something, it all of a sudden is over. Or time passes too slowly because what we're doing is not what we want to be doing. Okay, so time passes. So, so that's just one human example of time uh, space uh, perception. And um, I will go into the physics of this, but uh, there's a lot there. Casa Rinconada, uh, the circle of time. And another part of Chaco Canyon, you have the Casa Rinconada uh, Kiva. It is as close to a perfect circle as, as humanly possible without using uh, instrumentation. It's a perfect circle. And uh, it itself is also another kind of calendar. Uh, it's, it's, it's predicated to position of the sun, very much like those earth lodges, the, the Skidi Pani, uh, the, the uh, Kiva is covered very much like this building is, and there would be positions uh, or, or niches cut into the ceiling that would allow uh, both sunlight and moonlight to come in during certain times of the year. Um, so again, that idea of, of, and this is the way it looked uh, about 10 years ago when I was sitting on the, sitting on the wall of, uh, of Casa Rinconada, you know, waiting for the sun to rise. Uh, actually sitting on, sitting on that niche that is aligned to that sunrise. So we know that Native people were observing things, looking at things, trying to figure out things, uh, trying to measure things. Uh, we had a form of, uh, of what today is called science, but it was much broader and, and really was predicated in a different kind of worldview uh, than what Western science is, is today. And so you have petroglyphs in Chaco Canyon. This one is of the 1274 uh, supernova, which appeared 1274 uh, amid uh, lots of sun, solar activity like we're having right now. We're having tremendous uh, storms on the sun. Uh, so this is a very active period of, of solar flaring on the sun. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was the supernova, which is now the Crab Nebula. So you have the supernova exploding. Uh, it was so bright, uh, it could be seen during the day as, as kind of a, a second sun. And uh, during the night, it, it literally lit up the sky so that uh, the crescent moon uh, was in a particular position, apparently, during that uh, supernova explosion. And so that's, that's what's being captured there. And that's the way we think it may have looked, you know. Uh, to the observer. The nova moon is what this is called, the nova moon. The moon and the supernova. Uh, other places like Hovenweep Castle in Utah, you know, use another kind of, of way of just using the building itself to um, capture light and to guide light in a way that allows you to understand where the sun is uh, during summer solstice, winter solstice. And so Hovenweep Castle sits on the edge of a mesa, and, uh, but it's positioned in such a way that as the sun moves from one position to another, that the sun comes into these niches, which are cut into the walls, and goes right into the structure and hits the opposite wall, and actually dances across the wall in such a way as, as, as when it's coming into summer solstice, the summer solstice house or the winter solstice house. So we know that these, these walls were probably uh, had uh, paintings. They probably had uh, depictions in which they were, they were calibrating and they were marking the different position of the sun during different times. You know. Now the reason why you know, they needed uh, more or less exact timing of summer solstice, winter solstice is because uh, many of our ceremonies are timed to that, calibrated to that time. Uh, so that they knew when to begin preparations and when to actually bring out a dance or do, do a particular ceremony based on, you know, trying to hit the summer solstice, uh, winter solstice timing uh, and also equinox timing. 
So uh, in Hovenweep, you know, if you take a look at the structure, you can see that, that uh, spot of light. And uh, they usually had some niches cut in so that, so that the light would dance around because the sun moves around, you know, and, and so it, or the earth moves around, not the sun, but the earth. And so it kind of dances around and then finally it lights up that niche uh, during a certain time of year. And you can actually do this as an experimentation just by creating a, a dome and you know, putting holes in it and then guiding some light into the, into the floor or an adjacent wall and you can play with light and positions of light. So that's the same thing that was going on. So, you know, based on that, we also stored, you know, this experience in a variety of different ways. So all tribes have star stories. All tribes have star stories of how the, how the son, uh, father, you know, came into being, uh, his guidance of, of humans on earth, we have structures that are dedicated to uh, the Pyramid of the Sun, for instance, in Mexico, uh, which itself is an is, um, is astronomical uh, mountain, if you will. Uh, there are certain positions and certain places in the mountain itself or the structure itself that you observe a summer solstice sunrise and sunset. Uh, that's a part of a, a complex of uh, ruins uh, in Mexico. So you have the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon. Uh, each one is dedicated. Then you also have what is called the Peck Cross that's associated with uh, another Peck Cross that's in the mountains that uh, are used as the sighting point for the, for the sunrise uh, and sunset. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of, you know, at this point sort of segue in and sort of finish my talk by talking a little bit about the significance of this Peck Cross because this is... Uh, this is the same kind of structure that we saw 8,000 years before in the uh, medicine wheels. It's a similar structure to that. It's, it's created in such a way because there's a cross also associated with the, uh, pect with, with the um, medicine wheels. And uh, so the pect cross is uh, probably one of the oldest uh, sighting devices that have been used by native people. What's interesting about the Peck Cross is you find it not only in North America, but you also find it in Europe. Uh, you find it in Great Britain. Uh, you find it in, in um, South America. You find it uh, almost anywhere uh, where uh, paleo peoples have been. And so there's, there's an interesting kind of mystique about the Peck Cross because um, uh, this was kind of the, both the central sighting device and also the central symbol of, of a whole uh, knowledge system, if you will, uh, that then led to the development of the um, Mesoamerican calendar, uh, the Mayan calendar, the uh, Aztec calendars, uh, all are, in a sense are, are thought to have originated from the ideas that surround the Peck Cross. So the Peck Cross is the most basic uh, structure, the most basic symbol of this tradition of star knowledge. And um, so what do you think the pet cross, have you heard or read anything? What do you think the pet cross is about? What have you heard? What have you read? Anyone? No one's read 2012 stuff? Oh boy, it's really juicy. <laughs> A lot of controversy, lots of Von Donican type of aliens landed here and they're coming back and all those things. Anyone? Does it um, have to do with uh, the 26,000 year cycle? Um, apparently, uh, we point towards the North Star, uh, the, the North Pole. Yes. And um, was it 13,000 13, years ago, um, say, Pointed towards Vega, yeah. And other stars. So I don't know if that's correct. But does that have something to do? Yeah, it does. It does. It it is. It is. Um, it's counting. It's a kind of counting system, you know, for uh, the twenty-six uh, thousand-year cycle. The what we call the long count in uh, the uh, Mesoamerican system. Uh, long story short, the, there is a metaphor that is uh, associated with the pet cross. It's it's the tree of life the tree of life and, and the stories and understandings around that. If you take a look at the, um, 
the uh, Milky Way, uh, what you see basically is a um, is a uh, kind of a pathway. Many Native people refer to the Milky Way as as the path that uh, that the deceased take as they go back into the heaven, which which is also uh, a, a very common story among Native people. Uh, but the, the, uh, the, the, if you take it metaphorically and look at the whole of the, uh, of the um, Milky Way, uh, it looks like a tree. It looks like a tree, a tree and that has uh, you know, two branches across. Uh, that, and, and so the stars and clusters of the stars are formed in such a way. And so the tree of life metaphor uh, is, is, uh, is, is a metaphor that, uh, that according to the Maya, for instance, that um, as we go through these long count cycles, uh, and what's happening right now is that our, our sun is aligning with uh, the center of the universe or the center of the Milky Way. You know, the Milky Way basically is the center of our, 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 our galaxy. So our sun basically is aligning with the center. So there's a direct, you know, um, from point A to point B, there's a direct line between our sun and that center of the universe. And in the center of the universe is this uh, black hole, which the, um, which the uh, Mayans uh, call Shibalba. And uh, this black hole is kind of the, the, uh, the wormhole through which um, life comes and goes. Life comes and goes. That there's a back and forth kind of movement between you know, celestial life and not just not life as we know it, you know, uh, biological life, but life of the universe ebbs and flows through this, through this black hole. And so the black hole is, is considered to be the originator of our uh, universe of our cosmos. And so the alignment with that center becomes a very important marking point in time for human uh, culture and also particularly for human transformation. So a lot of the 2012 mythology is saying, well, the world is going to end and this and this and this is going to happen. Um, the Mayans say, no, that's not, that's not what's happening. What's happening is the, the, the world and human beings uh, uh, have a choice to make at that point in time as to which direction they want to go with their lives and with their, with their, with their civilization as, as has been made many times before by human cultures. Uh, it's really the start of another cycle, a fifth cycle, a fifth sun uh, of uh, 13, um, um, uh, nine, uh, or, or rather, th uh, 13 uh, periods of 52 years in which there is creativity and growth and transformation, which is then followed by nine periods of 52 years of uh, uh, less order and uh, a movement towards uh, chaos. So it's creativity and then chaos, creativity and then chaos. And basically, they say the the dynamic for that emanates from the black hole, which is in the center of the tree of life, which is represented by the Milky Way. <clears throat> and so our alignment with that point in, in the galaxy is also uh, thought to be an alignment or, or reformation of a new sun and a new epoch of, in time. Um, so those are the kinds of thoughts, you know, that I, I, I don't want to go into any further because um, that gets me into my 2012, and I'm holding back on that one till. <laughs> so, uh, for for these kinds of structures, catching the sun and moon, catching the essence of the sun and moon positions, knowing where to be on these very important times was a very important kind of thing because what again what indigenous people were trying to do was establish a resonance between themselves and between life on earth and what was going on in the cosmos, in the, in the sky, in the heavens, so on earth. So that finally, what, uh, what is happening basically, and what I hope you see in, in, fi in finishing the talk, 
is that indigenous people all over uh, this continent were intimately involved with, um, uh, with, in a sense, trying to, to, as much as they were able in their society, in their culture, in their traditions, in their songs, in their dances, in their art forms, in everything that they did to align themselves with this, this energy that they knew was in themselves, this cosmic star energy, if you will, and, and with the energy that they saw and that they perceived uh, in, in the night sky, in the heavenly bodies as they move from place to place. So in uh, California, you have uh, the myth of the star uh, uh, or the story of the old man in the crystal house, which is how the Shumash Indians of uh, California viewed. Uh, the Shumash had a whole, very much like the, the Skidipani, had a whole tradition that revolved around the movement of the sun and moon. During, uh, during winter solstice, they had special ceremonies to pull back the sun, uh, you know, so that it wouldn't go too far north and uh, it would stop shining on them. Uh, and they created a whole system based on the on top was the, uh, the uh, star priest of the Shumash, in which they would redistribute all of the wealth of the community before uh, these, uh, this winter solstice, they would make sure that all the widows had food to eat and all debts were paid. And then they would come together in a very special ceremony, which they called the tying of the sun. And they had this huge crystal, you know, and uh, a very special kind of, of tether that they tethered themselves. And they danced basically the sun back into its proper position in the sky. And this was after a story of um, the battle between order and chaos, uh, which they saw unfolding in the night sky, which included the, uh, the so Star Kyot was their, their uh, trickster figure and their culture hero. And Star Kyot led a team of stars that fought the uh, old man Crystal Sun and his team of stars for dominance in the sky. So they would move back and forth, you know, these two teams battling. One was chaos, one was creativity. One was chaos, one was creativity. And so the Chumash were hedging their bet by helping Star Coyote win the game each year so that it would, in a sense, perpetuate life on Earth by pulling back the sun uh, into its proper position. And so that was the role, among many other things, of, of uh, and this was the star disk, uh, sun disk that was used in tying the sun. Uh, there was various kinds of art associated with uh, the uh, star lores that native people have. Um, you know, the, the star priest of the Shumash, um, uh, we know probably used detura and probably other kinds of, of uh, uh, of uh, hallucinogenic uh, inducing plants uh, that they use for ceremonial purposes. And they created these amazing forms that we call star art. And um, they did this in the caves above Santa Barbara. There's a bunch of caves in that system because there's a lot of limestone. And uh, so we have some evidence, you know, of these star chart, these star art, uh, that was being done, uh, the, the, the depiction of star, st Sky Coyote, you know, and, and that uh, battle between Sky Coyote and the Old Man Crystal Sun uh, is also depicted in some of those. Um, the idea of paying your debts was also uh, ensuring that uh, by paying your debts, you brought order back into, into balance uh, or, or chaos back into balance. And one way that you did that physically was since by paying your debts, you know, before, uh, uh, so that there would be not be an imbalance, if you will. Uh, so again, empathizing with the world of star beings, paying your debts. So I'm gonna really finish with this last slide, which says that we, in a sense, are all star beings. As we think of ourselves richly and we begin to sort of recover some of our heritage of star allure and star traditions and star knowledge. I think part of this has to be about um, a rise in the indigenous mind, as I said, you know, as we begin to recover more and more of our traditions, more and more of our knowledge basis, 
uh, we begin to think of ourselves uh, more richly and know ourselves more richly. Uh, and, and I think that, um, that that knowledge also contributes, you know, to our understanding of, uh, of how people on earth attempt to, in a sense, resonate with, with the natural happenings of the world. And I think we have to begin to think in those terms again. You know, uh, part of what has put us into the fix that we are in right now with uh, global climate change and with economics and with governance and all of these kinds of things is that we think on such a mono uh, plane, if you will, and we think on uh, such a reductionistic level. Uh, and what uh, understanding indigenous systems and thinking is that they, they, they thought on cosmic levels. They thought on on uh, how humans as a whole relate to the earth, how humans as a whole relate to the cosmos. And they tried to predicate their ethics and their systems of knowledge and their forms of education around those ideals of resonance. Uh, and when you have those ideals of resonance, you begin to be very careful about what you do with regard to your relationships to each other and your relationships to plants and to animals and to the places in which you live. It, it forms a different kind of consciousness, is, is what I'm saying, when you begin to think in terms of this resonance uh, rather than dominance uh, over the natural world. So I'll leave you with that food for thought, you know, as you think about 2012. <laughs> <laughs> did you get this knowledge? Reading books, talking to people, yeah. all the... Oh yeah, reading books, talking to people. Remember, I've been a teacher for 36 years. I'm ancient. <laughs> I'm, I'm becoming a fossil too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, part of it is that uh, I created a curriculum and then I needed to understand the content that I'm presenting in those curriculums. So this is one of the course, course strands in that curriculum. So... Um, so yeah, you have to you have to educate yourself. Uh, you do your own research. You you ask questions. You hear, listen to stories with intent. You, you um, gather that knowledge, you know, and uh, sort of bring it forward and then share it. And, and so that's basically what uh, I do. Yeah. Keep doing it. <laughs> You're helping yeah, so, so the, but this is only a small part. I mean, this, this is a whole course, you know, see each one of those slides. There's, there's much more than I told you. There's huge, uh, a, a big story behind each of those slides about each of those peoples, you know. So I just sort of gave you some sound bites of, of that piece, you know. But, um, yeah, yeah. But there, there's a lot of interest, of course, in 2012 and the Mayan calendar and, and the end the end and the re inauguration of another uh, sun cycle, uh, another, the fifth sun, as we say, you know. A um, lot of mania behind that. I see that there's a lot of, there's even 2012 survival sites online. And you can Google 2012 and they're, you know, mind boggling. <laughs> uh, so even, even when the world ends, there's someone trying to make a buck off that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you got to watch those entrepreneurs, you know. <laughs> so, what are your special plans for 2012? <laughs> uh, I'm going to get up and greet the sun as I always do, and uh, have a good feed with my uh, good good meal with my uh, loved ones, and just sort of say, okay, well, let's start again. Let's look at the look at the world in a new way. It's a time of transformation. Um, the Mayans say that there are things that are happening, as you can see, uh, global climate change. There are, there are many things happening in the world that are, f are meant to force our attention to something that's very important for us to, to remember and to think about. And it, they're giving us indications that we need to change our consciousness. You know, these events, the Mayans say, are giving us um, 
forewarning that we need to change our consciousness about what we do, how we do it, especially how we relate uh, to our earth. And so, so those are the kinds of things that um, the 2012 uh, really is about. It's a time of transformation and change, definitely. But they've never said, the traditional Mayans have never said it's the end of the world. It's, it's, it's the entrepreneurs who have taken a lot of that, that knowledge and those prophecies out of context and have sort of reformed it into another kind of scare, you know, uh, for whatever reasons. But that's kind of human psychology too, you know, the, 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 uh, <coughs> that, that, uh, that kind of, um, you know, reaction. To, to this kind of information. So yeah, you have to, um, you have to understand it in those terms. Um, what, what, what is amazing, particularly about the, the Mayan calendar, the Mesoamerican calendar, and, and really all of these other traditions, because the Mesoamericans were not the only ones that were doing this kind of very elaborate thinking about the universe and the cosmos. I mean, most tribes had, had you know, sophisticated traditions. Um, is just, uh, you know, the elegance of it. It's just amazingly elegant, you know, in terms of thinking and, and understanding and perspective, a combination of creative thought and, and real observation. And so, so that's the kind of thing we also need today, you know, in our expression of science. You know, we need, we need the, cre the creative imagination to come forward. You, in Western society, you get some of that in, like, science fiction. You know, you get some of that imagination in science fiction, but it's not tied to, to, um, to, to how you operate in the world. You know, <laughs> it's not tied, tethered to society as these systems, because, you know, these knowledge bases informed uh, those communities, those tribes, those peoples of how to relate to the earth in a more respectful, more reverential, more resonant way. And, and that's the importance of this kind of understanding, perspective. Yeah.